Hello, my name is Ranger Sarah and I'm one of the law enforcement rangers here at Zion National Park. I'm also the search and rescue or SAR coordinator. As the coordinator, I'm in charge of organizing all the training, recruiting new, law, new team members, and trying to keep up with administrative duties of being responsible for such a large program. I'm also an instructor at the National Park Service's Western Basic Technical Rescue course hold, held in Moab, Utah every spring. We are currently outside the engine bays of the Emergency Operations Center with the new Zion Search and Rescue truck behind me. The Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, is where the emergency service offices are located. Upstairs are the offices for law enforcement, wildland fire, EMS, and dispatch. Here in the engine bay, we have an ambulance, a fire rescue truck, a fire engine, and the search and rescue truck. We also have supply and gear caches for structural fire, EMS, wilderness patrols, law enforcement, and search and rescue. In the second engine bay, we have two wildland fire engines, and outside we have a second ambulance. I'm hoping to give you a behind the scenes look at the search and rescue program. Search and rescue is a broad term that includes many subcategories, lost person searches, carry out rescue, technical rescue, swift water rescue, and helicopter or short haul rescue, just to name a few. Some incidents are created due to poor decision making or lack of preparedness on the part of the victim. Other times, they are accidental in nature and could have happened to anyone. Nobody ever wants to call for search and rescue, but we are always willing to help anybody in need of it, no matter how the injury occurred. I don't want to bore you too much with statistics, but here are a few that I think are important and paint a good picture of what search and rescue looks like in Zion. In 2019, we had 91 SAR calls, which was down 18% from 2018. I'm not entirely sure what our highest number a year was, but I know it's usually over 100 calls a year. The most common locations in 2019 were the Narrows with 16, the Subway with 13, and West Wind Rim and Angels Landing with 12. Most calls are for traumatic injuries, primarily knees and ankles. Heat illness and dehydration are the most common reasons for medical-based rescues. Last year, we had six technical SARs and eight rescues using a helicopter. Eleven people self-rescued after calling for help. The remainder either walked out with SAR assistance or were carried out. And, since the question is always asked, we had four recoveries from fatal incidents. Two, in, two were falls from Angel's Landing. As visitation in Zion has increased, so have the calls for help. So, how does a search and rescue incident get started? The majority of Zion National Park does not have cell phone service, even along the roadways. When a person is injured and needing help, they often have to find someone, whether it be a friend or a stranger, to, to, the, to hike to the trailhead and notify a shuttle bus driver or find cell phone service. This can take several hours. Sometimes, an emergency contact will call Zion Dispatch about an overdue party. More recently, we've seen an increase in people activating spot-type devices. Once Zion Dispatch re receives a call for help, the law enforcement rangers on duty are notified. One ranger will be designated Incident Commander, or IC, and they will start getting a response activated. Rescuer safety is always our number one priority. If we can't get to the injured party safely, we will take extra time or precautions to mitigate as many safety issues as we can. All rescuers must feel comfortable with risks and mitigations before the team leaves the trailhead. As information and conditions change, so too might our response. It is always being evaluated and considered. Our response is always measured and efficient, not rushed or chaotic. Rescue takes a long time and is never guaranteed right away. Along with rescuer safety, the condition of the patient is taken into consideration. We are willing to risk a bit more of our safety for life-threatening conditions than those that are not. I have a few search and rescue incidents I would like to share with you that exemplify the types of calls we get and our response to them. In November 2019, Zion Dispatch received a PLB activation. A PLB is a personal locator beacon that, when activated, sends an emergency signal with GPS coordinates to a nationwide dispatch center. The GPS coordinates put the location near a feature known as Jug Handle Arch. The common parking area for hikers to this area is Keyhole Canyon. A ranger was sent to the area to start investigating while two more rangers prepared to hike into Jug Handle Arch. While at the exit to Keyhole, the ranger interviewed a group that stated there was an injured 40-year-old male in the upper slot of Keyhole with a dislocated shoulder. He was unable to continue moving as both directions required the ability to up climb or down climb and the use of both arms. The group in the canyon had activated the PLB. 
The location of the PLB was later found to be about a mile from the coordinates it gave its location. This often happens when these types of devices are activated in canyons as they cannot get enough satellite coverage to give an accurate location. When medical providers got to the patient, they were unable to reduce the shoulder. The injury had occurred while climbing down a small obstacle in the canyon. It was the type of injury that could happen to anybody and was just bad luck. Due to the time of the year and the call, it was after dark by the time they made it on scene. Without being able to reduce the shoulder, the patient was going to need to be raised out of the canyon by the technical rescue team. Due to the unknown terrain on the cliff and edges above the patient and rangers, a call was made to Dixie Regional Medical Center to consult with a doctor. He advised that as long as the patient could be kept warm and comfortable with pain medication, he thought the risk of injury to responders and a technical team was not worth running the operation at night to remove the patient, to remove a patient with a dislocated shoulder. Lots of overnight gear and food was shuttled into the patient and rangers stayed the night. In the morning, a technical team was assembled before sunrise and were at the trailhead just after first light. The patient was injured less than five minute walk from the car, but due to injury and conditions, it took 22 hours to get the patient to the trailhead. The next incident happened in May of 2019 when a Zion shuttle bus driver notified dispatch of reports of a 22 year old male at the base of the Moki Steps in Orderville Canyon with an injured ankle. It took three hours to get the park medic on scene with the patient. Hiking up the Narrows and then Orderville Canyon takes a while, even for those that hike it often. Add to that needing to gather and then pack all supplies into waterproof bags and time gets even longer. It also probably took the companions of the male at least two and a half hours to hike out to get help from the time the injury happened. The base of the Moki Steps in Orderville Canyon is the farthest in Orderville a visitor is allowed to hike without a permit. Climbing up the Moki Steps and continuing up is both illegal and dangerous. Getting down the Moki Steps breaks more than a few ankles every year. In this case, the patient, who did not have a permit to be beyond the Moki Steps, had decided to slide down the rock into a pool instead of climbing down the Moki Steps. Often, people even try to jump into this pool. It is about 10 feet from the top of the Moki Steps to the water level. The pool of water is deceptively shallow when looked at from above, and when he hit the bottom unexpectedly early, his ankle broke. He was unable to bear any weight on the foot and was in quite a bit of pain. To get the patient down Orderville Canyon requires a rope, a litter, litter floats, and a lot of people. The litter has to be carried and then lowered through the swifter sections of water with rescuers holding onto it and walking alongside. The floats only help to keep the litter afloat longer and slow down the rate of sink should it be let go of accidentally. Once you reach the junction with the narrows, the litter is then attached to a boat. The boat is floated and dragged down the narrows to the riverside walk. This particular carryout took five and a half hours from the time of call to patient being at the trailhead and took 16 rescuers. In September of 2018, Zion Dispatch received notification of a 24-year-old male in the subway, Exit Hill, that was in and out of consciousness. He was reported to be about 250 pounds. If you aren't familiar with the subway Exit Hill, it is a steep route from the creek bed up about 500 feet to the plateau. During the summer, this route is in full afternoon sun and there is very little shade. Temperatures can often reach over 110 degrees Fahrenheit in the sun. Rangers happened to meet near the Left Fork Trailhead that afternoon and were able to make it on scene within an hour of getting the call. Due to the reported status of the patient, Grand Canyon Helicopter was called immediately to see if they were available to short haul the patient out. Short haul is when the patient and attendant are attached and then flown underneath the helicopter. Weather had been marginal all day in the area. Due to surrounding thunderstorms in the Zion area, Grand Canyon was unable to make it up to Zion. Helicopter shopping or trying to find a helicopter to take a mission when others have, been, have turned it down is considered dangerous and often leads to accidents. Once the Grand Canyon had turned the mission down due to weather, the litter team option was put into play. The team had been called out when the call initially was dispatched and was heading to the trailhead as they were still exploring the aviation option. During this time, rangers on scene were attempting to cool and hydrate the patient. Makeshift shade was created and cool water was poured onto the patient. He continued to go in and out of consciousness. It took 23 people two hours to carry the patient from his location up the hill through the semi-technical terrain to get to the ambulance. The carryout involved ropes to belay the litter as it was carried up the hill. The route is narrow with steep drop-offs, unstable dirt, and rock fall hazards. 
Six hours after receiving the initial call, the patient arrived at the hospital fully alert and awake with normal vital signs. In March of 2018, at 8.30 p.m., visitors reported hearing yells for help from Pine C Creek Canyon. A hasty team of three were sent out along the Canyon Overlook Trail to try and determine what was happening. When the calls for help were initially heard, two Good Samaritans started hiking and scrambling out along various ledges trying to assist the party. These two eventually got stuck as they were on the far side of Pine Creek and the water rose significantly over the next few hours. The hasty team was able to determine the location of the party while a technical team was assembled. Due to rising water levels and predicted rain and snow overnight, the decision was made to extract the party from the canyon that night. In total, six people were found in Pine Creek. Most had three millimeter or less Farmer John type wetsuits on. When they picked up their permit from the wilderness desk that morning, they had been advised of the weather prediction for the day, rain, snow, and cold temperatures, as well as warmed about cold water conditions in the canyon. They had decided to continue with their planned trip through Pine Creek. For many of them, this was their first canyoneering experience. They were raised out one at a time. It took 10 hours to get them out. Over six inches of snow fell on the rescuers overnight. All six were suffering from various states of hypothermia when they were medically assessed at the top. While this operation was happening, a couple other rescuers were diverted to getting overnight supplies to the stranded Good Samaritans on the far side of the canyon. They were in a dry and covered location and were able to spend the night safely with some supplies. The next day, it took a second team of rescuers about five hours to technically rescue the Good Samaritans who were still stuck across Pine Creek. Overall, this incident took 28 people, 22 hours, and three different technical operations to get everybody safely home. As I was telling you these stories, you probably were wondering what I meant by litter or boat. Let me show you. So this is our litter. Um, this is what all our patients are carried in. It does break down into two parts and is, can, can be carried like a backpack. It has two different sets of straps. The reds and blues create X's over the patient's chest and their legs. And then the black straps go crosswise across the body. So every patient is strapped in two times when they are in this litter. It's made of titanium metal and weighs 13 pounds. So it's pretty lightweight um, for rescue supplies. And it can be used in a variety of different rescue situations from carryouts to technical terrain. Um, it's kind of our all purpose go-to litter. And then our next kind of contraption that we use is called the chariot. It's this bright yellow contraption that's about 10 feet long. Um, it does have a mountain bike wheel on underneath it, which um, has a disc brake on it as well. So this is typically used for our carryouts off of Angel's Landing, where we have the pavement all the way down and also have the steep terrain where the brake is helpful and in some cases necessary to safely get everybody down the hill. The litter that I was showing you does attach. We just have straps. Um, we have six around the sides to strap the litter down once the patient's in it and kind of go from there. The next contraption is what we call our ATV wheel. So this is for more of our backcountry, uneven terrain type SAR calls. Um, this is what we use to haul that person up out of the subway that I was telling you about. It's also typically used in locations such as the Watchman Trail or Observation Point Trail. The litter attaches on these um, hooks right here. You just put those in along the rails and then there's a tightening knob on the side of the wheel where you can um, tighten it down so the litter doesn't go anywhere. Um, if you're using the ATV wheel, it requires a minimum of six people, um, and that's three on each side of the litter to navigate. With this contraption, you have a smaller turning radius just because it's quite a bit shorter than the chariot. Um, and so it does allow for more um, just movement on the trail and a little bit more leeway as we move. I forgot to mention with the chariot, it does require a minimum of four people to operate, one on the front, one on the back, and then two, one on each side um, for balance. And then our final um, contraption that I wanted to show you was the boat. So this is what we use to get people out of the, the narrows. And um, it was specially made for Zion, um, knowing that we have low water levels and a lot of dragging does need to occur through the shallow se sections. Um, it has handles on both sides um, of varying lengths. When 
We have rescuers in a SAR going on. We have to have a minimum of three on each side. Nobody can be wearing a backpack when they are on the boat just for hazards of getting stuck in the water. So these ones we have to be really careful about making sure we get enough food and water up for our rescuers, but also making sure we have a minimum number of backpacks on scene just to make sure that we don't get caught underwater. Um, the litter, again, just straps down with um, NRS straps on these crossbars that connect the pontoons together. And uh, there is, like I said, a lot of dragging. If we do have, like through the swift water sections, we will put webbing at the head and kind of use people as a webbing break to, to slow the boat down as it goes through those technical sections. Um, with any of these, but especially on the boat, um, hazards for us as rescuers are mostly knees and ankles um, because we can't, we have to be moving at the speed of the water. We can't see where our feet are going. And we definitely do have trip hazards and, you know, just hazards where we can step wrong without being able to see a rock. So, you know, none of these are, um, you know, foolproof or safety proof for the rescuers. And so it, it does put us in quite a bit of risk to be trying to drag this through the narrows and um, without being able to see our footing. So those are kind of our three contraptions um, that we primarily use here. We have a few other um, wheelchair type things that we can deploy for local area type stuff, but most commonly you'll uh, see these out, on the, out in the field. As I mentioned earlier, rescuer safety is our top priority. I mentioned the minimum numbers for each contraption. These are just to work the carry out device. That doesn't include the rescuers needed to clear the trail in front of the litter, rescuers to relieve those on the litter, people to sweep the river for sticks and the best route, and people to help the patient's friends or family. As you can tell, search and rescue involves a large number of people. The longer the carry out distance or the heavier the patient, the more people we need. With the subway carryout I mentioned, we ended up with 23 rescuers and needed every one of them. So, who are the people of Zion's search and rescue team? Is a team made up primarily of volunteers from all divisions within the park as well as members of our community. They are the rangers you see giving interpretive programs and picking up the trash. They are the rangers who issue you permits and check permits. They are the guides in town and the hostesses at the restaurants. They are current and retired firefighters who serve in the area. They are all people who volunteer because they want to help. Without them and their dedication, Zion Search and Rescue would not be the professional organization that it is. As we begin to open up again from the COVID-19 shutdowns, please be mindful of your impact when traveling and make smart choices. We all want to get outside, stretch our legs, and enjoy the beautiful parks. If you are visiting Zion or any park, please take enough food, water, and supplies with you. Wear appropriate clothing and footwear. Follow the rules, know your limits, and don't jump. By being careful and making good decisions, you can reduce your likelihood of needing to be rescued and limit your exposure to risk. We do realize that accidents happen, and then if it happens to you, we'll be happy to come and help you. Please stay safe out there.